um, thank you for still being here and thank you for the organizers, uh, to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I, I left the title of my talk quite general as you can see for the reason that, that uh, w when I was invited to come here I hadn't really done any work on curiosity myself. Uh, I had discussed in quite some detail with Pierre Rive about ideas uh, from a previous workshop we attended together and I'm, I was very interested in this topic. Um, but but uh, I hadn't really designed any studies that, 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 um, that aim to explore information selection and curiosity. My, my work is more, more uh, concerned with, with these areas, so I'm interested in how, how infants learn to categorize objects when they see different animals, how they know to distinguish, say, different ducks from, from rabbits, uh, uh, how, how they learn uh, which uh, b the, the multi-sensor integration between objects and the sounds they make, like uh, ducks quacking, and, and um, labeling objects, what, 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 uh, what is the effect of, of um, labeling objects belonging to categories, how does this, this affect category structure. And the, the methods I use in this work are behavioral measures, um, eye tracking, uh, measuring looking times, we've talked, uh, several people today have talked about looking times already, um, and pupil dilation I also use, and computation modeling. So these behavioral measures that, that are used in, in very many of, of um, not, not just by me, but in, in, in very many studies on infant cognitive development and uh, um, category development, they work like this, like in a familiarization novelty preference method, um, you would show the infant a number of objects from one category, uh, one by one on the screen, uh, while they sit, for example, on their mother's lap staring at the screen, um, and you measure their looking time, how much time they spend looking at each individual stimulus, and uh, you would normally expect and find that the looking time goes down as you present more and more of these stimuli from, from one category and then uh, at the end uh, you would show two paired stimuli for example in this case a novel cat, a cat that wasn't part of the familiarization set and a dog and you measure the looking preference to one of the two stimuli and what's in categorization research, what's normally inferred, is that uh, if they show a preference to the out of category item, like the dog in this case, they have formed a category during this task um, of cats and the dog is not part of this category. So obviously perceptual category formation in the task. So this isn't really information selection very much and, and there's little space for curiosity. The infants sit and stare at the screen in front of them one picture at a time, if they're lucky, two. So, so wh where, where is curiosity in this? And being invited here, uh, nothing focuses the mind better than a deadline like this, uh, was to, to think about the implications, that the relationship between these looking time measures and these very controlled experiments, and I think there's nothing to be said against this type of experiment, even in the context of a workshop where we talk a lot about exploration and, and um, independent information selection, because these are really, really nicely, very closely controlled studies. Uh, there, there is a relationship, I find. Um, because we have to, we have to consider that, that infants, when they <coughs> orient to information, they also learn from this information. And, and um, curiosity, information selection, is not merely about orienting to, to something that's interesting or novel. It is, it is perhaps the reward is, is uh, from eliminating the novelty, from eliminating the surprise. So maybe we... Uh, <laughs> We, we, we attend to, to novel and unusual information because, well, several people have raised this, because of the prediction error, and then we want to eliminate the prediction error by learning from these stimuli. Now, often this, this process from orienting to this important information to, to learning about it is, is, is kind of glossed over a little bit. So we say, okay, maybe there's a Bayesian selection mechanism, there, there's uh, improving of learning and so on, but, but, but we tend to perhaps be not, not be very concerned with the learning mechanism itself. And this, this is, I think, where, where these kind of studies come in, because they help us to understand the learning mechanism, how, how the infant developmentally goes from having access to a certain piece of information by looking at it, to actually learning about this piece of information, to integrate this information into her already existing uh, knowledge space, so to speak. 
So if you want to understand this, this elimination of surprise and making something unsurprising as the basis of, of um, curiosity, then um, I think we need to understand the learning mechanism and changes in the learning mechanism that helps us or that helps the infant to, uh, to achieve this, this elimination of, of surprise. So that's what looking come studies help do. They, they help us understand um, uh, through measuring the looking time at individual stimuli and the looking preference to understand better the learning mechanism by which infants acquire information instead of just seeking out information. So uh, in order to understand uh, the, the change in this mechanism or what, what affects this learning mechanism, we can ask several questions. So, so what affects looking time? What, what do we know as a field of, of uh, researchers studying preferential looking? Um, what, what affects these looking times? Well, we know uh, that age makes a difference, that the nature and the variability of stimuli make a difference, and uh, also that the order in which the stimuli are presented to an infant make a difference. And, and that's what I want to talk about a bit. So, so what, oops, what, what are these effects? And um, web content. Uh, yeah, it says I have some use some web. Oh, I think there's an update coming. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, so how, how much time do infants spend looking at objects? Um, uh, sorry, I just have something here on my screen which you can't see, but it didn't. Work. Right. Um, so, so uh, what, what affects how much time infants spend looking at objects and then uh, also present a computation model that, that models some of these experimental results, a model that has previously been used uh, to account for some data in infant categorization. Um, and and uh, I'm extending this model to um, look at um, curiosity-driven learning. What happens if we let an infant choose the information? First of all, um, to, to pursue this, we have to, in a sense, operationalize, understand what, what, what does infant looking time mean. And there are different models. Perhaps the most famous one is, is Sokolov's comparator model. The idea here is that, that uh, infants look at a certain object and internally encode this object, build an internal representation of this object. They compare this internal representation with what they are looking at. And if there's a mismatch, they adjust the internal representation um, and they go through this cycle of, of um, encoding, uh, comparing, and adjusting until the internal encoding um, is a match of, of what they're looking at, and then they, uh, the infants then disengage from, from, from the stimulus. So that's an operationalization of, of, of looking time. Uh, why infants spend longer looking at something more unusual? Because they have to traverse this cycle of adaptations more often. So, um, as I said, we know that age affects looking time. Um, familiarization speed uh, increases with age, so infants need less time to look at stimuli to get familiarized to them. Um, there aren't very precise explanations why this happens, but, but uh, well, theories generally have said this is a, a processing speed issue. Infants who are older are just better at um, at processing visual information. They process in visual information faster. Could it be because they are more skilled at it or because of increased myelination of the processing neurons? There, there hasn't been much speculation on that. We also find individual differences in, looking, in looking times, and some people have already uh, mentioned some examples here. We know that, that the familiarization speed at a, in a young infant predicts later IQ scores, for example. So there are, there are um, the, these differences that we find, and, and uh, Celeste has just mentioned something related here. Um, there are other age effects, and, and here's a study that in fact doesn't use looking time, but pupil dilation. The, the, the size and pupil change is also an indicator of, of, um, of surprise and, 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 and interest. This is a study uh, I did with my postdoc, Yichuan Chen, uh, about learning the association between um, complex objects and complex sounds. Basically what we were interested in, uh, do infants learn the sounds that certain animals make? So we had a training phase here um, where cartoon animals walked along the screen and made, made a specific sound. There were two animals, each of them made a specific, quite distinct sound. Uh, we tested this with 12 months old and we were interested in um, then do the infants uh, are the infants then surprised when they see, say, the first animal with which makes now the second sound? So there were three test items. 
the familiar pairing, what, like something they had seen before during the familiarization phase, a completely novel animal making a novel sound, and uh, as I said, these switched animals where, for example, this animal makes this sound or this animal makes this sound. And we were interested if, if, um, if, if there was increased pupil dilation to, uh, to any of these violations. So um, pupil dilation um, is, is a, a measure of, of various functions apart from luminosity changes. Um, attention, memory load, um, arousal, general interest has been used for quite a long time with adults and for uh, a few years already now with infants as well. So we tested 10, 15 months olds and, and adults and here's what we found. The onset here is when, when, when the animal at test makes the sound. Um, Ten months olds didn't really show any difference between any of the three test conditions. Fifteen months olds showed an initial response to the perceptually novel animal with a perceptually novel sound and then showed a very late response uh, where, where the, uh, even the, the cross-modal violation uh, aroused more pupil elation, elicited more pupil elation than, than the familiar test item. But adults only had a brief um, phase of, of perceptual, uh, uh, perceptual novelty. They, they did not show any response to the, to the crossover of the multisensory um, violation. We, we, we can see this result within a framework of, um, of perceptual narrowing, I find. I, I think. So we know from, the, from uh, the infant literature that there are certain domains in which infants become adapted, attuned to their environment. Uh, usually the time frame given is between six months old and one year old. For example, the most famous example is of course uh, um, speech sounds um, that for example Japanese children um, tune out of the distinction between R and L. Six month old Japanese children can detect the difference between R and L. One year olds and adults cannot. Uh, this is a kind of, of perceptual tuning into the relevant differences um, in a child's environment. We also find this for faces, that young children can distinguish human faces equally well as different monkey faces, uh, but at one year old and adults again cannot distinguish monkey faces as well as human faces. And we find this in multisensory integration, that young children are more willing in a sense to try and integrate different kinds of multisensor information, but um, adults also tune into um, more specific relationships here. And we think this is something we, s we see here as well. So, so, so that this is not a maturational age effect, like perhaps the speeding up of familiarization is, but we find here uh, a tuning into the environment, which affects the learning mechanism. So, so certain novelty aspects, certain differences, will just be not as interesting to older infants, for example, than to younger infants, because the older infants have already become so attuned to the specifics of their environment that they wouldn't perhaps even notice such differences anymore. So with age we find faster processing, but also tuning into the processing of certain relevant contrasts and the tuning out of, so to speak, of irrelevant contrasts. And we find individual differences. We also find, uh, what's been mentioned before, that young infants prefer to look at complex stimuli. Oh, there's a question there. So yeah, uh, just a question about your previous uh, results about uh, pupil yeah. How do you relate this with uh, experiments about uh, multimodal learning that... About what, sorry? To multimodal learning that basically show that when you present inconsistent stimuli, the reaction time is longer than when you present uh, consistent stimuli and even in adults, uh, I think, and this doesn't seem to show, even it's not the same measure, but mm -hmm. it doesn't have to have this effect in adults basically because for consistent and inconsistent stimuli, it's mm -hmm. the same uh, pupil dilatation. So, <coughs> do you have any yeah, you know, uh, about the relationship between the two phenomena? Yeah, well, that's a very interesting question. So, for example, you find when you, when, when you have to identify a dog and you play a sound of a dog barking, right, that people are faster at, at, at identifying this. So, um, there, of course, there, there can be an, a facilitatory effect for matching information. Um, I can't remember what the baseline is, if there's, in fact, an inhibitory effect for mismatching information or if it just doesn't help. Do you remember that, these results? I think it's an inhibitory uh, effect, I think, because you take longer time to, to, yeah, to react mm -hmm. to this uh, sound. Perhaps then, uh, I mean, the, the 
they still have to process both streams of information, obviously, but, but uh, there might not be an, an attempt at, at integration, but perhaps this processing of multimodal information per se could, could slow down uh, looking time. I, I don't know. That's certainly a question worth following up. And in fact, uh, Yichuan Chen, who was my postdoc here, he did these studies with speeding up of barking dogs as well. <coughs> so I'll ask him. Um, right, so com coming back to the, to the uh, complexity of stimuli. So uh, these are very early results. It was Franz in, in the 50s and 60s who first um, discovered that infants like to look longer at novel stimuli. And here's Here's the original contraption where the infant lies uh, on, on a little cot here and the experimenter can look from the top and show different stimuli. And, and this is one of the original results replicated many times that infants would prefer to look at this stimulus over this, at this stimulus over this, and they would look at, prefer to look at face-like stimuli even over other complex stimuli. So there are some, there are some uh, perhaps intrinsic preferences that, that can be driven by bottom-up high contrast uh, but probably also by some top-down effects for preferring faces over, over other complex stimuli. Uh, so, so there are a priori, priori uh, looking preferences depending on the nature of the stimuli. We also know that the variability of objects uh, shown during a familiarization phase affects the categories that infants form. So for example, in one study by Oaks and colleagues, they, they showed a, a number of highly variable uh, stimuli uh, in one condition and a number of very similar stimuli in another condition and they found that uh, when infants were familiarized on this highly variable set of stimuli they, the, the, they generalized the category to a far broader range of, of uh, novel stimuli than in, in, the, in the narrow uh, familiarization range. So the, 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 the nature of the relationship between the stimuli in the familiarization phase makes a difference for the, for the broadness of the category, uh, breadth of the categorization of the categories that are formed. To confuse things, and, and this has come up once or twice today already, uh, infants sometimes also show a familiarity preference. Many, many of these studies, as I say, are based on the novelty preference, but uh, there are many cases when you can find a familiarity preference. For example, um, um, for complex stimuli, when, when infants haven't been habituated for a long time, they tend to show familiarity preference. Um, and they show a switch from having a preference for the familiar stimulus to the novel one. You can show this when you, when you show a paired stimuli to infants of which one of them always stays the same and the other one always changes. You can find that initially the infants will orient to the familiar stimulus and at some point rather rapidly, often from one trial to the next, switch to the novel stimulus. And the switch over time again depends on age and of course on the complexity and nature of the stimuli. In some studies, in fact, uh, the paradigm looks for a familiarity preference. For example, in studies where uh, infants learn, like what I just showed about the animals, um, and I have, uh, you can have a similar paradigm with words that you have, for example, two objects, each of them is labeled, um, and then in the test phase, you show both objects next to each other and play one label. You expect the infants to look at the object that is labeled, not at the novel object. So perhaps by indexing part of an object's representation, namely the label that might be is then already linked to the object, you expect the infant to, link, uh, to look at the object that is linked to this partial representation. And the same if you do these animal sound studies, you can do them in the same way, show both animals next to each other and then play one of the sounds. What we found consistently in 12 month olds, they look at the animal that, that made the sound during familiarization. Whether whether this familiarity preference is the same as one that you find um, in, in, the, in the categorization studies when you have complex stimuli is, is to be determined. We don't, we don't know this. So if we repeatedly had this test phase, um, would we then at some point find a novelty preference? Uh, it ha hasn't been done. But it's, it's of course complicates the picture of looking preferences. Also when uh, in studies about learning the sequences, um, learning sequences or regularities in sequences, uh, we, we find a familiarity preference. So when you play a sequence of syllables to, to infants and, and you, uh, you, uh, you expect them to extract the statistical regularities in the sequences, you find an orientation towards a familiar sequence, not to a novel sequence. Um, so familiarity preferences are usually controlled for in, in well-designed studies. Um, and, and theoretically, I think they're 
considered perhaps more, more of an uh, annoyance than, than anything that usefully can contribute to our understanding of preferential looking. Um, but, but they certainly should play a role in theorizing here. So for, for the next few um, uh, studies I want to describe, I, I have to briefly explain to you this important study by Younger from 1985 already, a very classic, very important study that has been used and varied in many ways. Uh, this was a series of studies she did, um, uh, but I, I just present one, uh, the simplest case here. So, so the, the familiarization simile here were these kind of cartoon animals, each of which had uh, four different features, tail, uh, legs, neck and ear. Uh, and ears and, and these varied systematically. So the thickness of the tail, the length of the legs, the length of the neck and the distance between the ears could, could be uh, systematically varied so that you could basically develop a taxonomy or, uh, uh, or metric over the similarity between these animals. And in the simplest study she um, uh, familiarized infants on, on training animals that varied, where, where all the features varied freely and she found that, that um, infants uh, formed a single category of these animals and this was found by comparing the looking preference to the average animal which wasn't part of the training set but it was the prototype, the average value for each of these four features. Uh, so the category prototype versus more peripheral stimuli and she found that infants preferred to look uh, at the peripheral stimuli and not at the average. Because the average, in a sense, is the most familiar stimulus uh, uh, if infants have encoded all of these stimulus as a, as a category. And this was, this was found with 10 months old. So they formed a single category and the average was, was in a sense, less interesting than the peripheral ones. Now, this study was, was used a few years ago by, by Meta and Plunkett to investigate whether the sequence of familiarization stimuli actually has an effect on the categories that the infants form. Um, and they found, yes, uh, the uh, sequence does matter. So what they did was they, they chose two, uh, no, because normally you would show these, these animals in a random sequence. Here they didn't use a random sequence, but they, used, they had two conditions. In one condition, they minimize the pairwise distance between successive familiarization animals. So this one was very similar to this one, which was very similar to this one, and so on. So this was the minimum distance condition. And the other one, they did the opposite, they maximized the distance. So they used, uh, the first stimulus was maximally different from the second one, which was maximally different from the third, and so on. And you would probably expect that a random presentation would be somewhere in between these two extremes. So what they found was that it was only in the, in the high distance condition when the successive animals were maximally distant from each other that the infants actually learned a category. Sorry, what, what was the category here? Uh, basically the same result as, as this, that the infants formed a looking preference to the peripheral stimulus than, than at the central one. Okay. So everything is one category? Yeah, yeah a single category. So in, in the low distance condition, the infants failed to even form a category, but in the, in the maximum distance condition they did. And the idea was that as, as they had to encode successively maximally distant um, stimuli, they had more chance to explore the prototype uh, because they would, in a sense, cross the prototype uh, more often as, as they were comparing or, or encoding stimuli that, that lay on, on the extremes of the category. So, to summarize these effects, there are quite a number of stimulus effects on, on looking time. Uh, there are a priori preference to preferences to look at certain stimuli. There, are, uh, there is a familiarity novelty preference shift that depends on age and stimulus complexity and the duration of exposure. And um, we find that even within a fixed set of stimuli, the order in which these stimuli are presented also has an effect uh, on, on category formation. Uh, so I, I want to present a, a very, very simple computation model that, that does not account for several of these effects. For example, it doesn't account for the familiarity novelty shift and so on. But it's a model that, um, that has been um, used successfully previously in, in, in um, categorization research to understand the, uh, the mechanism underlying 
these familiarization novelty preference studies. Um, this is work I've done with Katie Toom Toomey, my uh, postdoc, and all of this work has been done in the last three weeks, partly for the reason that she only joined my lab four weeks ago. So this is all very much work in progress, and I'd be very happy to hear you if you have any more inspiration and, 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 and suggestions to make. So um, here, here is again this opera operationalization of looking times that infants have to go through this cycle of comparing and adjusting their internal representations. Um, this this uh, idea was translated into a simple neural network uh, into a simple neural network model by by Marshall and French in 2000. The idea here was that you use <coughs> an outer encoder model, based where the input is the same as the as the output as the target. Um, and what the model does is it perceives it perceives a certain um, uh, object, it in, uh, encodes this object in by compressing uh, representations, then it, it decodes it um, to produce to reproduce it on the output side, and um, the model, of course, as neural networks do, adjusts its weights to learn for each object to to produce reproduce it accurately. So so this th this this idea. Uh, is that, that this encodes this, um, this cycle, the comparing and the testing between the input and the target and the adjustment as the weight adjustment in the model to make the, to make the output more similar to the input. And they, uh, they modeled quite a uh, uh, nice set of, of behavioral data and made some behavioral predictions um, that also turned out to be true with infants. So it's, it's a, a well-validated model in a sense for, for um, modeling these simple preferential looking results. So uh, the idea, of course, the underlying idea behind a model like this is that, that in these familiarization preferential looking studies, what, what the infant does is extract the perceptual regularities, the regularities presented to it, um, and, and, and generalizes from, from them. Um, yeah. So uh, we, we used this first to model the, the, this effect of stimulus order. Uh, we encoded the animal features, uh, uh, the animal drawings by the feature values. So each animal had four, four inputs, four feature values. Um, we tried to make it as similar as possible to the infant study. So each, each stimulus was shown for a fixed number of times, uh, 20 weight updates here. Um, and after the familiarization phase, um, we tested the infant on the same prototypical and peripheral stimuli. And we trained 24 models per condition. Um, so the first question to ask was, does the order of the familiarization stimuli make a difference? So we ordered them just like in the Mater and Plunkett study uh, by pairwise minimum distance, maximum distance, and also included a medium distance condition here. Here are example sequences for minimum, maximum, and medium distances, you can see. So here are the results. This, this is uh, basically testing the infant on the whole stimulus set during training, so basically uh, seeing the, the convergence of the model in encoding this category of, of uh, stimuli. The, the blue line is the one with the, with the minimum distance, where the, all the successive um, uh, stimuli were more similar to each other. The red line is the one for the maximum distance. Uh, we see that, that, that using the max in the maximum distance condition, um, convergence of the model is uh, much smoother than in both the minimum and the, uh, and, and the um, uh, uh, medium distance condition. And if we then look at the network error, which is the equivalent of looking time in this model, we find that, that uh, in the maximum distance condition, um, category formation in a sense is better. There's more, more looking uh, at the uh, at the peripheral stimulus, than than in in all the other in both of the other conditions. Um, well, the model does form categories even in the minimum distance one, but that's that's hard to prevent in models like this because um, they can't look away basically, right? Uh, when you present a stimulus for twenty iterations, the model encodes it twenty times. So there's no mechanism in in this model. It's non stochastic to to um, to reduce looking time at an uninteresting stimuli. So, so that accounts for, for uh, the, the, the simple idea of, of extracting perceptual regularities accounts for, for, for these ordering results. Um, however, uh, so, well, so what we find is that, that structuring the environment optimally for the model uh, affects learning success. But of course, a curious learner um, is one that structures the environment for, for him or herself. 
selects information uh, based on the perhaps expected information gain. So, so we adopted this idea to uh, implement curiosity as um, the drive to maximize the learning progress. Mm -hmm. Now, in, as I said, in a network like this, learning proceeds by minimizing the internal error, the discrepancy between the input and the, and the, uh, and the output, which is the same as uh, the target is the same as the input. So the, the discrepancy between the input and the output of the model should be reduced and the model um, adopts its weight to reduce this discrepancy. A uh, curious model should therefore select these stimuli in a way that enable to minimize this error most effectively. Uh, we know in a neural network uh, like this, a very simple network, the weight adaptation is, is a process of gradient descent, um, adapting the weights in a, in a way to minimize global error, and the gradient uh, is this equation target minus output times output times one minus output. So, so uh, output times one minus output is the derivative of the, um, of the activation function, the sigma activation function of the output units. So Using this gradient, curiosity-driven learning we, we could implement in the model by uh, always choosing the next familiarization stimulus that maximizes this term, because it would, this would maximize error reduction. And this is interesting because uh, the target minus output term describes the relationship between the model and its environment, and the uh, output times one minus output term describes a, a kind of an internal state of the model, the, the plasticity. Uh, O times 1 minus O uh, is maximal at 0 0.5. Here, here is the plot of this gradient function. We, we find that, so here for example, when um, output and target are the same, the value is 0. Uh, when they're maximally different, it's also 0. But intermediate, um, there's a, there's a uh, um, phase of maximum absolute value. So this would be the, this would be the stimuli that, that the model should be aiming for to, to choose um, the ones that, that maximize this function here. So what we did was, uh, and, and, uh, a stimulus was familiarized and, and, and then the model checked which of the next stimuli will maximize this term and chose that one to, to, uh, uh, to explore next in a sense. So here is uh, the learning plot, how well the model learns, comparing the red line the, that, that we call the curiosity model uh, with the uh, blue line, which is the random, the normal, the typical order uh, in, in these studies, the random uh, presentation of stimuli. We find that convergence is much improved for the curiosity model, and we also find that, that um, the uh, curiosity model, in a sense, learns the category better than uh, a model based on random presentation, indicated by, by significantly higher, in a sense, looking time to the peripheral stimuli. If you compare this uh, curiosity model with the one in which we had maximized the distance, which, which also learned better, we don't find much difference altogether in convergence, and we also don't find any difference uh, in, the, in, in the, uh, how well the category has been learned. So, Intrinsic curiosity-driven learning by, by, in a sense, um, taking the stimulus that maximizes learning success uh, does just as well as, in, as optimally structuring the learning environment of the model. Mm. However, curiosity-driven learning did not always choose the maximally distant stimulus. So here's uh, an example sequence. This one is perhaps the most interesting one. So this is the ranking of, of the, of the uh, dissimilarity one one would be the most dissimilar object, two is the second most dissimilar object. So the, uh, here are seven objects left, six, five, four, three, two, one. So the, the second out of seven most dissimilar ones, the fourth out of six, the second out of five, third out of four. So the model kind of switches between, between stimuli that are quite dissimilar and quite similar. Um, and, and does just as well as the, as the model with a maximum distance. So, as I said, this is all really recent work. This is, in fact, work that was done two days ago. Uh, so, so we will naturally explore this further to try and understand better what, uh, what, what drives the model to, to, um, to uh, make choices like this and how this, how, how this can make learning more effective than, than uh, perhaps even um, choosing maximal, maximal distance. So, to, to, to sum this up, um, this information selection mechanism is a 
complex function between um, previous learning, the current state of the learner, uh, the environment, of course, what information is available, the learning mechanism that, that changes, of course, across development, and the developmental state of the whole system. So the learning mechanism, of course, affects previous learning, what, what was learned before, and the developmental state affects the learning mechanism. So there are complex interactions between these factors, I think probably quite similar to what Pierre-Yves said before as well, these complex interactions between these different aspects of the internal and external um, properties of the learner. And here, something I, I didn't even touch yet, perhaps uh, the, uh, the information selection mechanism itself might, might develop. Uh, we, we've heard some evidence of individual differences and, and, and uh, cultural differences. Mm. So, so, so the question is, is this information selection, this, this curiosity mechanism something constant, which just receives different types of input to lead to different results, or is this curiosity mechanism itself something that develops? But in any case, these changes in the model are moment by moment, and, and um, I think it's important to understand them to fully, fully understand uh, what underlies curiosity and how information is selected. I just want to spend one minute to show that, that, that we've um, started some pilot data with, with infants to basically show them all the stimuli at one point uh, 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 at the same time. So they are shown for five seconds and then they are uh, reordered and shown for five seconds again. Mm -mm. And, and, and here is... Um, Here's just a quick video uh, of how this works. So this particular infant has a particular preference as well for the top left location, something to, to, to uh, take into account. But occasionally also samples some of, some of the other similar. Of course, the question is here, is there a systematic systematic exploration of the space. Uh, we haven't really, because these are really early pilot studies, we haven't really uh, decided how to analyze this. One could, for example, do Monte Carlo simulations to understand if the, if, if the, um, if the sequence is random or see if, if there's a, 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 a relevant subset of stimuli sampled during each of these presentations. What we find is, is that um, Mm, across this is across five or ten I think ten infants uh, that that they do sample uh, all stimuli and, and and so well I can't really say anything about analysis but there's scope for analysis of this so to conclude then uh, what can we learn from lab based experiments that are so closely controlled and just consider looking time about curiosity well we can learn what is the learning mechanism for which curiosity provides the optimal inputs and how does this learning mechanism change over development um, and therefore, how will information selection change over development? In order to answer this, we need to understand how the mechanism changes. So uh, if, if we consider curiosity as eliminating surprise through a learning mechanism, I, I think these uh, simple studies and well-controlled studies can, can provide some meaningful answers. And I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators and thank you. Whether in the um, in the last study where they compared the um, sequential versus the maximum, mm -hmm. so whether a, a limited uh, memory trace would not predict the same results. So if you only average the last mm. items, yeah, those would mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. randomly located. Mm -hmm. In the yeah, I, I think so. And the model, in fact, makes this prediction because in the model, if you if you show very similar items and then and then you move on in the input space, then then what you learn later, in a sense, will override what you've learned earlier. So the model will have a big problem to to integrate the, the initially learned relations with the later learned. So that's exactly the explanation. Whereas if you if you if there's a broader scope to to um, of stimuli to encode, the model has to has to learn to to in a sense, keep trace of all of them at the same time. I'm not sure if that is very different from, from the explanation that Meta and Blanket gave. Um, but yeah, no, I would certainly agree with, with, with that formulation of it. Does that make sense? You, you look skeptical. Yeah, yeah. No, no, but I think that you know, it's a problem for the other explanation. If that that the prototype is sampled. In the longer path, mm. it looked like the last items were around 
the prototype. Mm. Well, that was just an example. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so that wasn't exactly the, the sequence they used. Um, <coughs> but of course, what I want to illustrate there: if you always maximize the distance, in the end, when there are only two stimuli left, you can't necessarily maximize the distance because, you know, each stimulus is only shown once. So they will, of course, obviously not all have the maximum distance from each other, Doesn't, because there were only two left in the end. Hmm? Yeah. Then if I understood correctly, you use this um, expression T minus O times the derivative of O to yeah. choose the next stimulus? That's right, yeah. But how do you do that? Because in order to evaluate O, you've already chosen the stimulus that you... Yeah, in, in a sense, you, uh, yeah, so, so what you do is in, in the model you, you take each, each stimulus from the set, but without adaptation you present it to the, to the model uh, to, to, to compute its value. Um, so you get an output, but, but you don't adapt the model as a consequence. Of course, you, the infant probably wouldn't do it like this, so, so I expect there, there might be more some kind of, there could be even a heuristic uh, uh, prediction. So you run through the training set, it's decide which That's one right. you're going to use to adapt. That exactly, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so you mentioned at the beginning that your model does not account for familiarity to novelty shift. Mm -hmm. But ultimately what you're doing here is also trying with your sort of curious version is to maximize learning progress. Mm -hmm. So we've been arguing that such a maximization of learning progress quite elegantly and naturally gives rise to a familiarity to novelty shift mm. depending on sort of the shape of the learning curve mm -hmm. whether it's more like an exponential versus more of a sort of sigmoidal mm -hmm. kind of curve so um, the prediction being if you have these sort of sigmoidal like curves that you should get a familiarity to novelty shift and mm -hmm. in the exponential case you wouldn't. Okay. So that sort of raises the question what your learning curves mm. look like and whether that maybe accounts for why you don't see something like a familiarity to novelty shift in your model. Well to be honest we didn't investigate it. Uh, as I said these simulations were done two days ago and that's given what you're saying that's certainly something we'll be looking at then. Unfortunately we, we only um, we, we, we only modeled the, the encoding of the whole of the whole uh, training set uh, when, when I plotted when I plotted this, so we can't really see anything. So we we didn't we didn't look at the at the development of looking or error for, for the test stimuli. So so that's I, su I suppose what you're suggesting is that that's what we should be doing to understand if it, it does show familiarity preference. And why do these curves look so wild? With <laughs> well, b so it's because each each individual stimulus is shown for twenty for 20 um, uh, uh, iterations of weight updates and then you choose a new one. So you, so you would expect some, some um, uh, every, 20, every 20 sweeps you would expect some bumps because that's when a new stimulus comes uh, which will partly interfere with, with what's been learned so far and will therefore lead to, to more interference. That's why. But as we see, as it, because it goes down globally, uh, the interference becomes less and less. So when a new stimulus is inserted, it, it um, it interferes less and less with what has been learned before, and much more so in the curiosity condition than, than in, 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 than in the particular, in, than in the random condition. Okay, so if I understand it right, it is a smoothness mm. that is illusory and, and causes our trouble. In fact, there would be a, a big jump but between 20 and 21. Mm -hmm. and yeah. It would be a discontinuity there. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, when, uh, the, the learning mechanisms with, with, um, with neural systems, as in some o other of your other models, can include um, neural networks who are growing with time, mm -hmm. or where the structure is changing, or where, in general, the complexity is changing with time. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I think that the, when, when you are considering this possibility, then the measure of learning progress in that case could be not only used to select the input, but also used uh, to trigger the, mm -hmm. the the growing of the complexity of the neural network or the growing of the complexity of the of the computational power of the compression mm -hmm. uh, engine. Mm -hmm. Is this something that you? I'm certainly, as you, as, you, as you rightly say, I've done this in other models uh, quite a bit and, 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 and also I, in a variation of this model I, I used um, a hidden layer of Gaussian units that, that shrank while it learned. So that's also a developmental change that, that, that led to uh, changes in the encoding. In this model I haven't done this yet, but, but um, 
it's it's probably something worth exploring. Particularly, uh, I, I was planning to to um, uh, explore something like shrinking shrinking um, uh, Gaussians in the hidden layer to understand um, how how um, how this model could move from from uh, encoding of individual features to feature relations. If that makes sense, that's something I've did before in in, in, in in related model, and and this could account for more of the uh, experimental results I haven't um, sh shown here today. Uh, but I, I think for this particular very simple categorization task, it probably isn't necessary. So I would be surprised if, if for such a simple task, you would find a lot of structural adaptation in the model, even if you allowed for it. Did you uh, change uh, the compression? Uh, I mean, so how, how critically do these um, results depend on, for example, the compression ratio in mm. ordering code? Or, and did you actually look um, whether the features alone by the hidden units change, uh, if, uh, depending on presentation sequence? Well, OK, you mean OK. So, so um, right, to answer your first question, um, because the specific model only had four input units, um, and, and, and you want to have the hidden layer be smaller than, than the, the input and output unit, there isn't much scope for varying that. So it, we, we use three, <laughs> and, and it works. If you used one, I'm sure it, didn't, it wouldn't work. I've tried it previously with some other models. Two also doesn't work so well. So yeah, it has to be three. <laughs> um, but, uh, so I, I guess what you're suggesting is, uh, uh, in the second part of your question, to, 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 for example, what could do is to, to plot the hidden activation patterns uh, for, for the different stimuli. What, what I would expect to happen is, is that, that um, we there would be a, a, a broader, uh, there would be more difference between the hidden unit representations in, in, in both the maximum distance and the curiosity model than, than in the minimum distance model. And, and this could probably account for uh, partly uh, account for these results that we find that the model is more more uh, robust to interference when new stimuli are shown, for example. So you'd say that differences, I mean, that the variance somehow of these three dimensions, uh, three uh, patterns of the in your three neurons are more different? Yeah, it's, uh, well, that's normally what you find is, is, is that, um, that w w when category encoding uh, increases in detail, that the hidden layer representations in a sense spread out. <coughs> so that's what I would expect here as well. Is there a question in the back or just no? Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.